I was recently watching women swimming, for scientific purposes of course, and I noticed that often when one swimmer is ahead, the other swimmers in the neighboring lanes seem to swim closer to that faster swimmer's lane. And even when two swimmers are neck and neck, they often swim close to each other. So the idea I had as to why they do that is because one swimmer can use the wake of the other swimmer to move faster potentially. But is that really the case? And if so, by swimming in these formations, how much does that affect the drag of each swimmer? That is what we are finding out today. So we are looking at this paper called Steady Hydrodynamic Interaction Between Human Swimmers. And it's open access, you can find that link below. And in addition to looking at swimmers next to each other, this paper also goes through when one swimmer is directly behind another, which is also of interest for other competitions like, for example, Ironman races. So let's get into this research. So swimming in formation isn't just for people too. It, um, other creatures do it as well. For example, have you seen ducklings swimming in formation? And then the authors point out that even fish in schools are effectively swimming in formations as well. And of course, we have seen old birds really flying in V formations, or at least a lot of different types of birds, like the mighty ducks. And for that, this last one though, while this is definitely to reduce drag, I think it's mainly for a different reason. At least that's what I'm predicting because the reduction in drag a bird will experience from flying in a V formation is more about reducing the induced drag, which comes about due to the lift it is producing. On the other hand, swimmers, not just human swimmers, but swimmers in general, don't seem to produce much lift or drag all the time, or at least much of the time, because they don't really need to. So if there is a drag reduction, I think it's because of a different reason. Now, the authors say that for the typical competitive swimming style, except for butterfly, there are three main components of drag. The skin friction drag, the pressure drag, which is primarily caused by the wake of the swimmers, and then the wave drag, which is literally the waves created. Now, they don't say why butterfly is different, but if I were to guess, I might think that it is perhaps because there is some induced drag forming because maybe the person has to produce lift to get out of the water, or maybe that's thrust, I'm not too sure. But anyway, uh, they don't say that butterfly is included in these other three types of swimmings as well. And also butterfly is more stylized drowning than swimming anyway. But anyway, focusing on freestyle, backstroke, and breaststroke, the three different components of drag are the skin friction drag, pressure drag, and wave drags. Now, if you remember back in the early 2000s, when the shark skin swimming suits were around, they were skin friction reducing technology. And if you don't remember what this hubbub was, well, the gist of it is that these swimming suits were developed and the surface was very slippery. This was partly because it had this shark skin like texture. And shark skins are incredible because they have all these tiny striations all over, it, which helps compartmentalize turbulence and reduce the skin friction drag. Now here is where it gets a little fuzzy. So these swimming suits are mostly banned and you can only partially wear, like you only wear some partial ones. So ones that either go from your hips to your knees or about that kind of length and not the full wetsuit ones. So this was apparently because the drag reduction was so much that it gave you an unfair advantage. Now these authors say that these suits and technology like them can reduce the condition drag between about 2% and 10%. And that the condition drag accounts for only 5% of the swimmer, of the, of the drag of the swimmer overall. As such, these suits could only reduce the drag by about maybe 0.25%, which they characterize as negligible. That's a quarter percent, which may not seem like much, but I think that every swimmer would still take it. Now, in contrast to that, wave drag accounts for 50 to 60% of, of the total drag of a swimmer. It's the majority, not 10%, 50 to 60%. So as such, even a 10% reduction in the wave drag is a huge advantage. That's 5% overall. One well-known way of reducing the wave drag is by swimming under the water. And the deeper you go, the lower the wave drag is because you don't generate large waves on top. That is why when swimmers dive into the pool, they go quite deep and swim along. The problem is that we need to breathe air, so we need to surface sooner or later. That is where potentially swimming in some kind of formation will help. The researchers, as a preliminary, suge preliminary suggest, say that um, perhaps if a trailing swimmer was positioned in the upstream swimmer's wake, such that the upper body was in the wave trough and then the wave's peak would be around the legs, then this trailing swimmer's own wave would, might, would cancel out and reduce the wave drag. I think that there is one other mechanism for reducing the wave drag, but there might be others too. And for example, I think perhaps the wave would effectively be pushing this trailing swimmer down, like when you're at the beach and you're riding a wave. 
So in figure one, we see the wave patterns in the left column of a single swimmer, the yellow dot. And then in the lower figure, we see that you have an upstream swimmer and two downstream swimmers in a V formation. There is definitely a difference in the waves that you see in the wake here. And you see like the ones with the two swimmers, the waves don't really seem to fan out nearly as much as you go downstream. It is also apparent to, to note that the lane barriers during competitive swimming didn't isolate the lead swimmer's wake from the trailing swimmers, which is important to note because I'm sure that the lane barriers do affect the amount that the lead swimmer's wake comes through, but there are still some waves coming through. So we can see that there's definitely an interaction here, but how much that affects the drag? Let's find out. So let's go into the methods section to see how these researchers figured this out. So the researchers stress that they were only interested in the wave drag because uh, they also acknowledged that yes, the skin friction drag and pressure drags of the trailing swimmers would likely change. Um, and apparently they reduced for the trailing swimmer, but the wave drag is what they're focusing on here. Now in figure two, they show their swimmers geometry and they're quite plain. They're literally just missing the arms and effectively just triangles with heads. So the arm motion and the leg motion are ignored for this study. And here in point four, below in figure two here, we get an interesting fact. So these researchers say that they didn't take into account the effects of the lane barriers, as we mentioned earlier. Yes, it is known that the lane barriers do absorb some of the waves, but apparently, according to other research, they only attenuate about 70% of the wave's height transmitted to the neighboring lanes. So 30% still gets through, which is still potentially a good advantage to, to use. Now we get to an interesting research approach. So you might be thinking that they used CFD or experiments or even real world testing, but no, they used a 3D potential flow approach. This is really cool. So if you have, haven't heard about potential flow, you don't really know what it is. On our YouTube channel, we have covered the fundamentals of it and how to build it up into a useful numerical approach. If you watch videos number 52 to 61 in our Aero Fundamentals playlist, you can find out more about that. So in their setup, they tested up to three swimmers and they were all set to be swimming with the same direction in the same speed in the same direction and let's just quickly go through some interesting features so in equation 2.5 this one here we see the equation for calculating the pressure over the body and it's very simple which is one of the major benefits of potential flows so you break it down to stream functions and potential functions and then it is very simple to just figure out what parameters are anywhere in the flow in this particular case, the pressure at any point in the flow is equal to the density times the velocity times the derivative of the velocity potential with respect to the x direction. And that's it. So literally then you can figure out what the pressure is anywhere. And as for the wave drag coefficient in equation 3.1, it's what you'd expect. So that's pretty normal. Now to check the numerical method, they looked at the wave drag coefficients they got from the submerged ellipsoids. So down here in this figure here at different submerged depths and compared it to the literature. So let me zoom in a little bit here actually. So we can see these results and their results are bang on the experiment. So their results are the black line and the experiments are the blue cross plus some red lines for a um, higher order um, solver. So the top line is when the ellipsoid is submerged 16% of the length of it. And the bottom line is when it's, it's submerged 24.5% of the length. Now the x-axis is the fraud number, which we haven't covered yet in our area fundamentals playlist, but I'll go through it quickly here. So the authors give the equation of the fraud number in the paragraph above with the wave drag coefficient. So let's zoom in out a little bit. So just here, uh, where is it? It's just here, fraud number right there. And what this is, is it's the velocity divided by the square root of the gravity times the characteristic length of the object. Now, physically speaking, it is the ratio of the flow inertia to the external force on the object. Typically, it is the gravity force. Another general interpretation of that is that is the ratio of the hydrodynamic forces to the buoyancy forces. And when this number is one, the velocity of the object is equal to the wave propagation speed. Now, this number is incredible because in naval engineering, uh, we use this in this particular case, one major effect of it is to determine how big the waves would be and whether or not the object might be planning or not. Planning is the act where a boat, for example, is just staying steady and not bouncing up and down as it zooms along. The general consensus is that you hit planning when you exceed a certain velocity and that velocity corresponds to a full number of about one. However, I have seen some boats that start to plane at about a full number of 0 0.4 
which is also to do with lift produced because technically that changes the characteristic length as well when they lift out the water and it also greatly depends on the hull shape but anyway that is a discussion for another time anyway in figure three we see that as the full number increases from 0.2 to about 0.45 the wave drag on the y-axis the co coefficient also increases for both submerged depth and it does so very sharply i mean at the full number of 0.2 the wave drag coefficient is pretty much zero and then when you get to a full number of 0.45 the wave drag for the shallow ellipsoid is like 0.017 and for the deeper one is still like 0.0006 as the full number increases further the wave drag drops again. Now, the fact that the deeper ellipsoid didn't experience as great an increase in the wave drag coefficient makes sense because it couldn't produce as large waves because it was so much deeper. In addition to the ellipsoid, the authors also tested two cylinders and the results are shown in figure four. So let me zoom in a little bit here as well. So this figure is supposed to roughly approximate one swimmer drafting behind another to see if their numerical approach can give good results in this particular setup. Their results are the black line, while the experimental validation is given with the blue crosses again, and the red dashed line is a higher order panel method, so just a more accurate, ideally, uh, numerical approach. Overall, their numerical method performs very well, especially considering just how much simpler it is compared to like the full-on Navier-Stokes approach. The general trends are captured very well, and there are only some differences as you get to the peak of values. Everything else is pretty nice. So to describe what's going on here, in the y-axis, we have, again, the drag coefficient for the wave drag. And in the x-axis, we have the distance downstream one cylinder is as a ratio of the cylinder's diameter. When the cylinder is far downstream of the other one, in this case, more than two diameters downstream, the upstream cylinder has almost no effect on the wave drag coefficient. But inside 1.5 diameters downstream, the wave drag coefficient greatly is affected. So, for example, when one cylinder is just 0.5 diameters downstream, its wave drag coefficient drops by almost 40%. So for those who are approximately cylinders, you should be swimming at about 0.5% 0.5 diameters downstream of other cylinders if you want to reduce your drag a lot. Then, as you'd expect, as the downstream cylinder surpasses the upstream one, its wave drag becomes much larger. But now, the maximum occurs at about one diameter upstream, which is a little surprising to me because the downstream cylinder experiences the lowest wave drag at about 0.5 diameters downstream, while the upstream one experiences the highest wave drag at about 1 diameter down upstream. So let's say you had to swim somewhere, and assuming that these results are so far accurate for humans, we'll get that, in, get that into a, uh, consideration later. But for now, even these results suggest that if you had to swim somewhere with someone else, you would benefit most if one of you was about half a diameter downstream because okay the upstream swimmer would have an increase in their wave drag but the downstream one is seen is seeing a much uh, lower wave drag so as a team there is a natural reduction and then after a little while you can switch positions and that saving is then shared that way you could swim further and make it to where you're going one other thing to note is that these researchers um are for the fruit number this is for a uh, 0.217 full number which is a little bit lower than the fruit number seen by competitive swimmers which apparently is more than 0 0.4 to 0.5 which is really high as such they say that for competitive swimmers the waves that stretch farther downstream also known as coven waves might play a greater role in the wave drag reduction so from figures four and uh, three I think we can conclude that their potential flow based solver has done a pretty good job approximating wave drag there are some inaccuracies at the local maximum and minimum, but for the rest of the time, the results are very accurate. Also, the trends across the entire ranges uh, tested here are replicated very well, so it seems like their numerical model is well validated. And while these researchers didn't typically use um, Navier Stokes CFD solvers, if you want to learn how to do open foam, for example, including advanced meshing like dynamically morphing and overset meshes, then you can take out courses below. But let's move on to the juicy results here now. Now in figure five, we see the model of the human swimmers the researchers used. And it is a 1.9 meter long model, which is about the height of a typical male swimming competitive swimmer. And it is lacking the limbs as we saw before, but the researchers are just looking at the general hydrodynamics of the human body shape. And one thing that I've always been interested in is how different sports affect a person's body shape. And in particular, how swimmers always have large shoulders, like there's almost no swimmer out there that has fairly narrow shoulders. That to me, if you look at it from a solely 
hydrodynamic point of view doesn't make sense because the best shape would be someone with a relatively narrow shoulders and then a gentle taper towards the hips and then a gentle taper towards the feet. In other words, an ellipsoid. That would re reduce the wave drag and the pressure drag, hence allow the swimmer to move faster. But from that purely hydrodynamic point of view, we ignore the biomechanics of swimming. So bigger shoulders means more power to push through the water. So while you may be getting a lot more drag with bigger shoulders, the extra power you get uh, makes up for it more than enough. Hence why swimmers usually don't seem very hydrodynamic, yet their shoulders are just too big from that point of view. Just as a fun fact, apparently the typical wetted surface area of a competitive swimmer is about 1.9 square meters. So in the left image in figure five, uh, just here, we see the numerical domain and the pool was two meters deep, so down into the page. And in figure six, we see some really cool results about how the swimmer's submerged depth affects the wave drag at different speeds. So zooming in here, a bit too much, there we go. Okay, so the overwhelming trend is that the closer to the surface you are, the more drag you will be producing, the wave drag, which is what this uh, x-axis, the y-axis is here. So the faster you go, expectedly, the greater the wave drag becomes as well. So the x-axis here. So by looking closely at the figure, we see local peaks and troughs. So for example, let's take the solid black line, this one here, uh, at 0 0.6 meters per second. So about here, we get a, a slight trough before a slight peak. Then at 0 0.9 meters, we get a slight peak. And then at 0 0.1, sorry, 1.2 meters, we get a trough and then so on and so forth. So why isn't this line simply smooth? The authors explain it that these peaks and troughs are when the waves constructively and destructively interfere with each other respectively. And the wave that are interfering with each other are the bow and the stern waves of the object. So this is essentially like sound waves where depending on how the waves meet, they can either join together and make even louder sounds or completely cancel out and be completely silent. As for how much swimming at the surface increases your drag compared to when you're submerged, the results are very impressive. So keep in mind that the red line is the friction drag and the pressure drag combined. So at two meters per second, if you were to swim on the surface, the wave drag is about 90 newtons. Uh, the friction drag and pressure drag is about 110 newtons. Uh, so the wave drag is about 45% of the overall drag. When you submerge yourself one meter and swim at two meters per second, the wave drag drops, it's like, five newtons, that's it. So a 95% reduction in the wave drag when you go only one meter below the surface. Assuming that that friction drag and pressure drag stay the same, your total drag is now about only 115 newtons. So you've cut down your total drag by 40%. So you can swim about 35% faster when all else is equal. That alone shows scientifically why when swimmers jump off the blocks, they dive down and swim as long as they can on the surface. Because even though they can't use their arms, they are relying solely on their legs to provide the thrust, they can still go faster when they're not near the surface. That's insane. So in figure seven, the authors have done a nice job portraying a lot of information quite succinctly on one figure. So just down here. The most important bit here is the black line, which tells us how much the wave drag of the downstream swimmer has changed as a percent. Just looking at this line, it's very thin, but let's zoom in a little bit. So. There are several important points to note. The first is that this is for the downstream swimmer is directly related um, it's when it's behind the upstream swimmer and not off to one side, which we'll see later on. The next thing to note is that when the downstream swimmer is literally at the feet of the upstream swimmer, so right here, the wave drag decreases a lot. So there's a reduction here. That's what this CDR means. And it's like over 100% which the authors say now actually you're getting a thrust from the upstream swimmer. It's not just reducing the drag, but it's now pulling you along. And that's great news for swimmers in like Ironmans and competitions where, okay, you're getting kicked in the face, but at least your wave drag is very low. And even to the point where you're being thrust even harder into the kicks. On the other hand, the upstream swimmer, I guess, might be getting a little boost from the kick as well. I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, <laughs> but while the right, um, being right on the feet of the upstream swimmer is incredibly good for wave drag. If you go literally just half a wave downstream, you then get a massive wave drag increase, 100% increase over that. So what's more, as you go downstream uh, even further, the impact of the upstream swimmer on the wave drag coefficient drops very quickly. Then after about three body lengths downstream, the wave drag coefficient kind of stabilizes and fluctuates between minus 50% and 50%. 
And that is interesting because the effect of the upstream swimmer has on your wave drag seems to be largely dictated by wh which part of the wave you're in. So here in figure seven, the blue color refers to the trough and the red color refers to the peak of the wave. So the, the crescent. For those who have even ever swam down a wave, the following result is very expected because what we can see here is if you position your body so that your upper body is falling down into the trough and your legs are on the peak of the wave, then you get pushed forwards by the wave and that's what happens when you body surf. The exact same thing happens here. We're positioning yourself like that where you get most of the wave drag coefficient reductions occur when you're just like falling down the wave. On the other hand, if you position yourself so that your upper body is coming up the peak of the wave and your feet are in the trough, then you're effectively trying to swim up a wave, which if you haven't tried that, you know how hard it is. So in that situation, trying to catch that wave is nearly impossible. And I guess actually in reality, because of the additional wave drag pushing you back, you will naturally fall into the favorable position in the next wave to come along, which is where your body is now falling down the wave and your feet are at the peak of the wave. That is for when one swimmer is directly behind the other. What about when there are two swimmers, but now one is side to the other one, the downstream one is in line pretty much. What happens in competitive swimming? So in figure eight, we see the results when the downstream swimmer is 2.5 meters to the right of the upstream swimmer and then staggered at different positions downstream. Now, one thing that I think could have been improved here is that they used a length of 2.5 meters. So it's non-dimensionalized to some characteristic length. It's, it's not, I mean. So that means that you can't really figure out exactly how important this value is. Does this change with different swimmers? Does it matter on the length of the swimmer or what? So perhaps the authors didn't know what, which length to use. Either way, it kind of makes it a little bit hard to understand how important the actual meterage is or how important the characteristic length perhaps would be if it was non-dimensionalized. So anyway, first of all, when the downstream swimmer is almost in line with the upstream one, there is no effect on the wave drag. And that makes sense because the waves from the upstream swimmer hasn't, haven't had time to propagate around and hit the upstream swimmer right here. You can see that the waves come down and they're nowhere near the, up, the other swimmer. The result um, is the exact opposite to what we have seen with the other two swimmers though when you go further downstream. So as the swimmer goes further downstream, uh, the upstream swimmer's waves have a greater and greater effect on the downstream swimmer's wave drag, as opposed to getting smaller and smaller, which was what we saw before. By the time the downstream swimmer is about five lengths downstream, the wave drag coefficient fluctuates between minus 90 and plus 90%. Unfortunately here, the value never goes above 90% or 100%, so the thrust is never created. And once again, we can see that the best position for the downstream swimmer is to be, again, falling down into the wave so that your body is in the trough and the feet are on the peak. Conversely, trying to swim up the wave increases the drag coefficient again. One thing that I would be interested to see is actually how the wave drag affects the side force of the swimmer. I say that because even though you might be reducing the wave drag coefficient by, let's say, 80%, that may not be what you completely save in terms of energy because what I think the wave will be doing is pushing you outwards. So you need to use energy to correct for that. So maybe effectively you might be saving 70% of your energy instead of 80%. Anyway, just as an interesting thought, I thought uh, that would be uh, important. So anyway, these results are for a 2.5 meter side-by-side -side gap. What happens at different distances? Now in figure nine, we see five different distances and 2.5 meters is the largest berth. And in essence here, the distance doesn't really matter too much. I mean, the trends are still the same and even almost the numbers. The only major difference is going from two meters to 2.5 meters with the wave drag option changes aren't that great. So the, that indicates that at this distance, the waves start to die out in terms of power. And um, if you go further than two meters, then that's when the major losses start to occur, it seems. But if you look at the distances we are seeing here, um, you're 10 meters downstream and 2.2 meters to the side, uh, the waves that are affecting you are, as concluded by the authors, these far field waves, the Kelvin waves. So similarly, the peaks and troughs of the waves have the same effect on the wave drag coefficient. And also as you go farther and farther downstream, and to the, sorry, to the side, it obviously takes more length downstream for the waves from the upstream uh, swimmer to hit uh, because they have to fan out and hit you. So that takes longer for the wave to get to you and hence the less power it get, has, I guess. So as a general rule, I guess you could say that you'd be pretty close 
You want to be pretty close to the swimmer's side, but a bit downstream. That way you not only get a wave drag reduction, but you also now have a buffer zone where you don't have to stay exactly where you are. You can still move around a little bit through to, I guess, a little bit of error or a bit of variation and still get a good wave drag reduction. Now in figure 10, we see a really cool figure. And this shows how the different placements of the downstream swimmer affects the constructive and destructive interference of the waves. So for the top right and bottom right figures, the downstream swimmer is situated just right so that its waves are merging constructively with the upstream swimmer's waves and creating bigger ones. You can see here, they're much redder and much bluer. Then on the left of the two figures, the downstream swimmer is situated such that its waves are messing with the upstream swimmer's waves. And in some cases, the waves are now being even annihilated almost completely. So while these constructive and destructive interference patterns might seem interesting in a fleeting way, they could also have significant consequences for other swimmers. So in competition swimming, you have eight swimmers across the pool. So if there is a third swimmer more outboard, then that one will be very interested in what the waves are coming in. And speaking of three swimmers, let's now have a look at what happens when you have two swimmers upstream and then a third swimmer downstream and in between the two swimmer waves. In figure 12, we see this exact setup. And if the downstream swimmer's position, uh, him or herself, uh, correctly here, it could get both the waves from the upstream swimmer's uh, impacting and potentially improving the wave drag coefficient. And in figure 12, we see that if the downstream swimmer is literally just half a wavelength upstream instead of downstream, so here instead of here, that leads to massive constructive interference instead of destructive interference. That's how sensitive it is. As for the effects of this downstream swimmer's wave drag coefficient, in figure 11, we see the results. So as you might expect, there are again regions of massive wave drag reductions interluded with regions of massive wave drag augmentations. The closer the two upstream swimmers are, the greater these effects become. Now in figure 13, the authors show the difference in the maximum wave drag reductions seen depending on whether there is just one upstream swimmer or two upstream swimmers. Zooming in here, here we go. So the red lines are for the two upstream swimmers and the black lines are for the, two, for the lone wolf uh, swimmer upstream. It is clear that pretty much regardless of how far up where you are uh, in the side direction, the downstream swimmer is, having two upstream swimmers reduces the wave drag far more, like almost double. So having two upstream swimmers, having their wakes impact you can potentially improve your wave drag coefficient much more than just having one swimmer. And it's clear that pretty much um, at some speeds and spacings, having two upstream swimmers can result in the downstream swimmer even producing some thrust. So <laughs> he or she gets pulled along instead of having to do anything. And that reminds me of actually one time I was at a rock climbing gym and there was a very portly man trying to shimmy up the wall and <laughs> far away he got tired and fell off. <laughs> and then he just starts yelling at the guy with the rope to pulling up the wall. Uh, and with that, we come to the end of this podcast. So if you're watching the swimming or if you're a swimmer, now you know that if you stay on the upstream swimmer's waves, you can greatly reduce your wave drag and save some energy to surge later on. And finally, if you want to learn open foam, including some really cool meshing techniques like overset meshes and sliding meshes, take our course and link below. And if you are doing aerodynamic experiments, did you know that there is probably a 2 to 4% error in your data, but you didn't even know about it? In the you Hawk link below, we go through why it is and how to fix it. So this podcast, make sure to hit the like button, if you see more like this, hit the subscribe and the follow button, and I'll see you soon. Peace, amigos.